human need to explore is deep within all of us. Our ancestors crossed mountain ranges, sailed open oceans to map new lands, and sought out the unknown while always looking to the stars. We're curious, and now we're at a place where we can pioneer new horizons. Because Earth, this blue planet and all its beauty is just our starting place. It's 10, it's 10, ten nine, eight, seven, six, six blue, five, four, and then start, two, one. Oh yeah, look at her go. 5,000 feet and climbing. Now is the time to open the promise of space to all and lay the way for generations to come. When our descendants look to the stars, perhaps from a rocky moon or colonies floating in open space, they'll remember this time. When they reflect on where it started, they'll remember this place. And when they honor those first explorers who said, let's go, this is Blue Moon. They'll remember these bold steps. We are of blue origin. And this is just the beginning. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live webcast of New Shepard's 17th Flight to Space and the program's 11th dedicated payload flight. I'm Jackie Cortez, part of our government relations team here at Blue Origin, based in Washington, D.C. I'm so happy to be joined by my co-host, Kaya Ehrlich, here at our company headquarters in Kent, Washington. This is my maiden voyage at the desk, so thank you so much for sharing this experience today, Kaya. I'm really excited for the launch. Thanks, Jackie, and it's my maiden voyage as well. I couldn't think of a better host to share today with than Jackie. Um, really appreciate this divider here. I know we're taking all the necessary uh, COVID precautions here at Blue Origin. Just to share with you, when I'm not here at the desk, I actually work closely with NASA and our New Glenn Orbital team, as well as the New Shepard Astronaut Sales team. So I'm really looking forward to sharing all the really cool science and art on board New Shepard today. I am too, and let's get into today's mission. Today is an operational payload mission. So what that means is there's no humans flying today, but there will be payloads on board, including the second flight of NASA's lunar landing experiment, which is actually a suite of sensors, computers, and algorithms that work together to determine where a spacecraft is located, its speed, and other important measures as it approaches the lunar surface, much more on that coming up later in the show. We also have New Shepard's first ever art installation on the outside of the crew capsule. We'll show you that here soon. Of the payloads inside the capsule, many are funded by our good friends in NASA's Flight Opportunities Program. These payloads are testing important technologies for our future of living and working in space. Yeah, and thank you so much to all of our customers and to NASA for flying on New Shepard today and for supporting this really important science. This is the 17th New Shepard mission to date and the fourth for the program in 2021. This vehicle is dedicated to flying scientific and research payloads, and it's the eighth flight for this particular vehicle. I mean, reusability is definitely at work here. Absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, our other New Shepard vehicle just had an incredibly exciting flight last month. Here they are. Um, this is our first astronaut crew. They've just gotten into microgravity. They're coming out of their seats. They're starting to feel that weightlessness that I know, Jackie, you and I are so excited about experiencing. I just love watching this clip. I mean, it was such a historic day. It featured both the oldest and youngest people ever to fly to space. 
It was such a special day. And also on board, in addition to Oliver and Wally, the youngest and oldest people to ever fly to space, was our founder, Jeff Bezos, and his brother, Mark. I can tell you, I have two brothers, and they keep asking me when they're getting their own trip to space. I told them they have to wait till after Kaya and I get a chance to go. But in the more immediate future, we have our next human flight coming up here soon. And also in the near term, we plan to combine payloads with crew to fly astronauts and researchers with their experiments to space. NASA's Flight Opportunities Program actually recently expanded beyond just payloads to also support researchers who want to fly with their payloads to space. This is a really cool program called Human Tended. It's a huge next step for the research community. I've been really lucky to see firsthand how industry, NASA, and the research community work together to make this offering happen, and we're really looking forward to that. Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to that first human intended mission. But in the meantime, hey, we've got another human flight coming on New Shepard really soon. So our astronaut manifest is filling up pretty fast. And let me tell you, we've been so humbled by all of the inquiries coming in from our astronaut email as well as our website. You know that we're actually at nearly $100 million in seat sales and just blown away by all of the interest. Um, I've been super fortunate. I've been on the receiving end of many of your emails, and I've been really touched by the stories that have been shared across the world. It's really a childhood dream to travel to space, and I can't wait to help uh, those dreams come true here at Blue. So if you're interested in purchasing a ticket to space, please visit our website. It's blueorigin.com. You click on the link, fly to space, and then once you're there, fill out a little bit of information, tell us about yourself, can't wait to read those. And then that's really your first step on your journey to space. I love that you can click a link to sign up for a seat to go to space, just casual. And the demand for seats has truly been stunning. And there's clearly a growing market for both people and payloads to fly on New Shepard, which brings us back to today's <laughs> launch. A number of the payloads are actually making their planned second or third trips to space on New Shepard today. And reusable vehicles like New Shepard are allowing for this rapid iteration. And we know the scientists and researchers really love that. One of the primary payloads on today's mission is NASA's Lunar Landing Experiment. This specific payload is a public-private partnership under NASA's Tipping Point Technologies Program, sponsored by the Space Technology Mission Directorate. This is the second planned flight for this sensor experiment. The first flew last October. We talked to the team and they told us they got some great data from that. And the goal here with this second flight is to further test the suite of sensors to reduce the risk and increase the confidence for successful missions to the moon. The payload is flying again, mounted to the exterior of the New Shepard booster. So the payload is fully exposed to that space environment. Let's take a closer look at how this sensor suite works. As you can see here in the graphic, the sensors are located right there in the ring fin on top of the New Shepard booster, and they give a view of the ground during ascent and descent. The avionics are tucked under the top of the propulsion module, and we have three main components working in this sensor suite. One of the sensors is responsible for determining the lander's speed and ground range. The second takes live pictures and correlates them to existing surface imagery. For this mission, we're using the West Texas desert imagery, but we have shown it works well for simulated lunar imagery too. And lastly, the final piece here is the descent and landing computer, which integrates those navigation sensors to support precision landings. And these sensors will allow much higher landing accuracy than was available during the Apollo era. That's right, Jackie. And I know that we took a lot of those learnings from that first flight and they've been incorporated into the second flight here today on New Shepard. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at that. The goal of the Tipping Point program is to advance our technologies for landing on the moon. We've been collaborating very closely with NASA on this program. NASA has been developing various sensors, LIDARs, landing vision systems for a few years now, yet they haven't had a capability to test them out. With New Shepard, you can start to think about taking a technology and flying it multiple times so that you can really understand how it's going to perform in the space environment. The beautiful thing about the New Shepard payload module is it's similar in size and descent trajectory to a lunar lander. So we're replicating landing on the moon using New Shepard. 
This will be our second of two planned flights for the program. We wanted to do multiple flights. We wanted to validate the data that we would get on the first flight uh, and then keep going. In the first flight, we were able to confirm the ability for the sensors to survive shock, random vibration, pressure, and thermal gradients. We were able to confirm the algorithms were working correctly. And lastly, we learned critical information about the LiDAR sensors. Both the Blue Team and the NASA partners collaborated together to evaluate the valuable data that we got. And we constantly have technical interchange meetings with our NASA collaborators. We have them joining us for these flights. We have them working with us to evaluate the data. And then we've placed it on data.nasa.gov for the community of space developers who also want to use these NASA sensors. So the data we gather from the second flight will first be compared to the previous flight to help us gain further confidence and verify the accuracy of the sensors. And from there, it's going to inform decisions we make on future investments in this technology, as well as define mission profiles for landing operations. NASA is such an important partner for Blue Origin, and we really look forward to continuing our work together. Recently, Jackie had the chance to talk to John Carson, NASA's Technical Integration Manager for Precision Landing. They discussed the experiment and ways Blue Origin and NASA have been collaborating on this. So excited to be here today with Dr. John Carson from NASA's Space Technology Mission Directorate. John, thank you so much. We're really excited to hear from you. Can you tell me a little bit about what the team learned on the first flight on New Shepard? Hopefully you guys got some great data from that. Yeah, we got, got a really, uh, really phenomenal data. You know, some, you know, I'll just, I'll just speak kind of in general. So it's part of an iterative cycle in, in technology development. So the first fl flight was, was, a part of that cycle. We went and tested um, a capability that, that has been in development for a long time. Um, we learned a lot about how some of the sensors performed in uh, the environments that were provided by New Shepard, the dynamic and the, um, the other environmental environments. We learned how they operated together within the integrated splice system. We took all that information back, made um, tweaks to not only the software, but also to some of the sensing hardware to help it be more robust or resilient during um, the flight campaign that, that we'll embark on in the second flight. So um, it's been very valuable data, and um, we actually posted some of the data on data.nasa.gov um, for, for broader you know, um, um, availability to the community. And we, we got great independent assessments of that data and great feedback that, that the team is, is, is you know, looking at as well. So, um, so we got phenomenal data from the first flight, and, and we're learning from it, and we're, uh, we've improved things as, as we embark on, on the second flight. It seems like sort of these reusable suborbital capabilities and the development of them has been really useful for specifically testing these kind of technologies here on Earth before they're used in space. Yeah, they're actually a game changer. Um, before suborbital testing capabilities uh, were available to the community, the first time we did the types of integrated system level um, descent and landing uh, testing was on the actual mission entry descent and landing which you can just imagine that those those can be billion dollar class missions that have risky entry descent and landing so the advent of suborbital vehicles and uh, enables us to combine systems together and go and test them in relevant conditions and and ultimately retire the risk as we mature the technologies that are going to be infused in spaceflight we love Tipping Point and love working with STMD. I think the public-private partnerships there have just really carried critical technologies like these so much farther. Yeah, the public-private partnership um, that's brought on through Tipping Point and other and other mechanisms has been um, great for the the NASA uh, technology advancement as well because we can integrate it as part of our overall technology development and infusion strategy. So it becomes a key key part of uh, how we're trying to mature capabilities for exploration. Well, we're so honored to be flying this critical technology again. So excited to be working with you and the team again. John, thank you so much for being with us today. Really looking forward to this flight. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. 
had so much fun talking with John, and I loved hearing about the great data and lessons learned they got from that first launch that they're applying here. Mm -hmm. And I know they're gonna get even better data today because of that iterative process, so really excited. With that, we're coming up on just under T minus 15 minutes until launch here. So Kaya, let's talk about what else is flying today. Jackie, I know you love this program name. So we have the Oscar payload flying today, again, actually on New Shepard. And it's an experiment led by researcher Annie Meyer. It was funded by the NASA Flight Opportunities Program. And the experiment is further proving out how to transform common spaceflight waste products into useful resources like water and propellant. So here's a closer look. A one-year mission, a crew of four, would produce around 2,500 kilograms of trash. I'm Annie Meyer, and I'm turning trash into usable resources. So we're taking that trash and converting it into gases that we can use for either venting off a spacecraft or using it for fuels. So I'm standing in front of what's called OSCAR. It not only produces these gases, but it's reducing the trash volume. No one likes to sit in a room surrounded by their trash, and neither do astronauts. And so the things we're studying for converting trash into gases has to be safe for the crew and therefore safe for use on the planet. My grandfather was actually a sanitation worker in the Bronx and so growing up I was very aware of trash all around us. I was always curious how can we reduce our waste or convert it but I really try to take it home with me and do everything from composting, trying to live as zero waste as you can, show others that if I can do this you can do it too. Oscar is some really useful science, and I admit I do love the name. I actually got to see the first flight of Oscar down in West Texas back in December 2019. Really excited they're back today. Also on board, we have Iron Soil, which aims to understand how space impacts the composition of soil to inform future agricultural products. Just another amazing example of how the science we're flying to space today directly impacts and benefits life here on Earth. Yeah, I mean, taken together, today's payloads really seem to hint at what a future of living and working in space could one day look like. So best of luck to everyone. A huge thank you to our Blue Origin team who's been working hard preparing New Shepard for her flight today. Yes, thank you Team Blue, thank you NASA, and thank you to all of our customers for flying such important and relevant science on New Shepard today. And while we're on the topic of payloads, we wanted to tell you about a new competition called the NASA TechRise Student Challenge. It's now accepting submissions from sixth through 12th grade educators and students to design, build, and ultimately launch experiments on suborbital rockets or high altitude balloons. Winners of this competition will receive $1,500 each to build their experiment, and they'll also receive an assigned spot to test it out on a NASA-sponsored suborbital flight Blue Origin is, of course, proud and honored to be one of these flight providers, and we hope all the students and educators watching today will apply. Please do. You can do so by going to visit futureengineers.org forward slash NASA Tech Rise. Yes, please do apply and please help spread the word about this inspiring initiative to all students and educators in your world. This is directly helping students gain firsthand experience with the design and testing process utilized by many NASA researchers flying payloads on board New Shepard today. That's right. And inspiring the next generation of our space workforce, really hard to think of a more worthwhile cause there. And at this point, we're just under T minus 10, oh, I'm sorry, T minus 11 minutes until launch here. Let's turn our attention to launch site one, which is home to all 16 of our previous New Shepard launches, with today being number 17. Launch site one has really evolved into much more than just a launch site. It's an important test bed for our lunar program as well. That's right. I mean, there's been several really interesting activities happening down at West Texas that are all about the moon. Uh, in addition to today's lunar landing experiment from NASA, we've also developed a lunar field to test hazard sensors hosted on platforms such as helicopters or drones. And it was originally developed with NASA JPL to test the hazard LIDAR and is now available for any kind of hazard sensor testing at Blue Origin. You can take a look below. I mean, it really looks like the surface of the moon. You've got craters and rocks uh, and hills and divots all over uh, the surface there. And if you've been down to West Texas, that 
dirt really feels like moon dust, uh, what we call lunar regolith. So it's a great testing field. We really look forward to um, having that LIDAR testing down there and all the learnings that come out of this hazard field in the future. I have to tell you, we need to see if we can get some moon buggies and be allowed to go out and drive around the lunar hazard field. We'll ask the engineers if that's an option. <laughs> it's very cool to be bringing the moon down to Earth in West Texas. And turning back to today's flight is one of my favorite payloads ever to fly on New Shepard. And it's actually the one flying on top of the crew capsule, right on the main parachute covers. It's a work of art commissioned by Uplift Aerospace for its Uplift Art Program. The program's purpose is to inspire new ideas and generate dialogue by making space feel more accessible and connected directly to the human experience. Okay, I love this story. The series of three portraits is painted by a world-renowned artist from Ghana, Amawako Bawafo. They depict the artist, his friend's mother, and the artist's own mother. Um, so big shout out. I know we have a lot of students in Ghana watching right now. Hello to Ghana and all, all the students. We look forward to what the future holds for you here in space. But Amawako told us a really special story that a mother's love comes from a place that is out of this world. So, I mean, how appropriate is it that his art is literally flying to space today? It's so special, and you just saw Amawako's art perched on the main parachute panels on New Shepard. There you see it in this B-roll. And I have to say, space is, of course, about pushing the limits of science and technology, but it's also about the human experience. And you do feel that when you see something like Amawako's art for the first time and hear his story. I know my mom is probably wondering what I've done for her lately when Amawako's mom is going to space, which is very cool. And today's flight is truly the epitome of STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Well, it does look like we are in a brief hold here, so let's take a look at New Shepard on the pad. All right, well, it looks like we're delayed here for just a few minutes. We'll update you on this hold as soon as we can, but let's take a few seconds to talk about our recent first human flight. It was truly a day for the ages. Let's take a look at some of the highlights. I have one more thing we need to do before we depart. This is called a challenge coin. On the front, it says presented by crew member seven for space flight on New Shepard. On the back, that says you are one of the first of millions of people living and working in space. So with that, the New Shepard 16 crew is Woo! go for launch. Oh, wow. Oh. 
History's a making, I can't believe it! <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I still get goosebumps watching the replay from that day. There was an awesome big group watching in DC and we had so much fun tuning in. Oh my gosh, especially Wally. What an absolute icon. I love her. Um, Kaya, you were lucky enough to get to do some of the astronaut training work early on. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Yeah, absolutely. So I got to go through our astronaut training program. Uh, we did two days full of training, followed by the third day, which was a simulated launch. And it was so much fun. It really gave you a taste of what it would be like to fly aboard New Shepard without actually flying aboard New Shepard. Um, crew member seven did a phenomenal job. We had Kevin Sprogue, a former naval aviator. And those of you AV geeks out there and pilots, I'm a fellow pilot as well. Uh, our training was all about that. It was it was followed by uh, rigorous safety training, and the flow was just spot on perfect. Um, so we really felt prepared for anything that may come along. We practiced a lot about getting in and out of our seat, ingress and egress in the seat, as well as practicing microgravity egress out of your seat, um, using your fingers and instead of pushing with your hands. Uh, it was an amazing experience. And hoping and looking forward to more folks experiencing what I got to experience and taking the launch. How was that feeling being in the capsule, like strapped in, like you're going to space? What did that, oh my God, I'm so jealous. What did that feel like? Oh, it's amazing. So what they do inside the capsule for training is they pipe in the sound from an actual launch and it's at the same decibels as you would experience during launch. And so there's no boom, bang surprises whatsoever. You hear the shoots when they deploy, you hear the separation from the spring system between the booster and the capsule. Um, so really what I did was I closed my eyes and I just went through the whole mission with my eyes closed thinking, my gosh, I cannot wait to fly. It is just a spectacular experience just in training alone. Well, someday when we fly together, I'll have an expert with me. So very excited for that. It looks like we are still in a brief hold. So let's take a look at New Shepard on the pad. Our conditioning 
requirements with two out of three sensors showing uh, bus range with 14.3 psi on the LH2 side. And we're just verifying stability with this extra time as well. Flight call is empty too. Well, we're going to be in a hold here just a little while longer, so it's the perfect time to talk about aviation icon Wally Funk. As you know, Wally flew on our recent first human flight. She's the oldest person ever to fly to space, and her resume is quite impressive. I know, Kaya, as an aviator, you must be so inspired by Wally's story. Absolutely. I think we all grew up looking up at Wally and what an amazing inspiration she has always been and continues to be. Yep. And it was such a big deal that Wally finally got the chance to go to space after being an early Mercury woman in the NASA program. Her hometown of Grapevine, Texas, threw her a parade and declared August 7th Wally Funk Day, which is, of course, now the best day of the year. So let's take a look. It was so good to see everyone here today on Wally Funk Day. Wally Funk, truly a national treasure. And I can't just, I can't get over how many young people, especially young women, must have been inspired by Wally's flight. Yeah, I mean, who doesn't love Wally? She's the greatest. I, all the little girls watching and the young kids, what an inspiration that this woman's journey has been throughout her life, really. I, she, she started young. She always wanted to fly to space. She had to wait till she was 82 years old to fly. But I think the biggest takeaway from this is you're never too old to live out your dreams. And so dream big and make it happen. It's never too late. Couldn't agree more. And we are still in a brief hold here. So let's check in again on New Shepard at the pad.
Well, we are out of the hold, and I do love seeing New Shepherd and hearing New Shepherd as she prepares for launch today. Kaya, can you tell us a little bit about our nonprofit club for the future and the work they're doing to inspire the next generation? Absolutely. So sharing the crew capsule with the science payloads today are thousands of postcards from students around the world flying on behalf of Club for the Future. We dedicate space on every flight to fly postcards and it's a core initiative of our foundation. It's one of the most tangible ways that we can make space feel accessible to students of all ages. That's right, and some of the postcards flying today actually came from students in our very own backyard in Van Horn, Texas. Club for the Future recently partnered with Van Horn to build the first ever postcard mailbox to space. The Postbox to Space is the world's very first mailbox that will take letters from the Earth, send them to space, and then return them to the senders. What a great drawing. This has been really an unprecedented collaboration between Club for the Future, Van Horn High School, and Blue Origin. It is an immense project that's been taken on by seven juniors and seniors of Van Horn High School who've decided that they have an interest in welding they have worked very hard from design all the way up through manufacturing. Well, we first started off with a cardboard template. After a few weeks of planning and designing, we eventually got into the shop, started welding together the base. We took the rocket kind of design, put some legs on it, and we're gonna make them look like fins. We've had a huge number of Blue employees who've cycled through here to help us out in really substantial ways. It would not have been possible without the support of a large number of Blue Origin folks. It is really great what Club for the Future is doing, that they're even giving us this opportunity to do things like this. Coming every week and providing supplies, paint, metal. I learned how to use a torch, I learned how to weld better. I learned a little bit more about the process in designing and mocking up a prototype. I truly hope that the students fully recognize how substantial their post box is going to be as a landmark in Van Horn. I'd like to invite the students to be the very first to use our post box. Woohoo! And hopefully will be an inspiration to all of the students who come through the school. Jackie, I don't know about you, but I am a girl who loves to tinker with tools, and I've got to say that that post box is so cool. 
Amazing job, everyone. And here's another cool one uh, from our club that, that may actually be coming to a backyard near you soon. That's right. In fact, earlier this week, Club for the Future announced the Estes New Shepard model rocket is now available. Here are some of our engineers down at Launch Site One testing it out and clearly having a great time doing that. Not sure we'd be able to do that on the National Mall, but we'll find out. The model has been designed and manufactured by Estes Rockets, and just like the real New Shepard, it's fully reusable and follows a similar flight profile to what you'll see here today. The capsule even separates from the booster near Apogee and floats back to Earth under parachute for a gentle touchdown in your backyard. I love it. I mean, to be a kid in this day and age, and even an educator, is amazing. My dad is a retired public school teacher, and STEAM resources were just so limited when he was in the classroom. I think he's a little jealous of what's available these days. I know I am. Kids are getting to launch their own missions. It really is an exciting time. And what's also cool is with each model rocket comes a Club for the Future postcard you can send to space and back on the real New Shepard. And of course, they're shipping in time for the holiday season. So go check it out at the Blue Origin shop. I can't wait to get mine. And I know Club is very busy, so there's another initiative Club is involved with that's about to roll out with several leading STEM education partners. Right, Kaya? Yeah, that's right, Jackie. Uh, one program that's about to launch is called Project Llanos. Thanks to a one-year grant from the NASA Office of STEM Education, the Project Llanos team, including the Aldrin Family Foundation, Explorer at Large, Public Consulting Group, the University of Kansas, and our own Club for the Future have been working together to create a series of immersive classroom-based experiences for fifth through eighth graders to become explorers of space themselves. Yes, and if Club isn't already doing enough, I have to mention that the team is also starting to work with each of the 19 nonprofits that were recently selected to receive $1 million grants from Club to expand their STEM programs, create new ones, all for the mission of inspiring that next generation to invent the future of life in space. Keep an eye on this and all of the initiatives from Club. The minutes are ticking down here to New Shepard's 17th flight. Kaya, can you take us through today's flight profile? Let's do it. So the rocket is sitting on the pad right now full of capsules, or full of payloads that are sitting inside the capsule. As soon as the rocket lifts off, it'll hit about 75 kilometers where that spring-loaded system will separate the capsule from the booster. The capsule will continue up over the Kármán line, which is 100 kilometers up. And the booster is actually more aerodynamic than the capsule, so it's gonna come down faster than the capsule. Um, and right before it lands, it's going to reignite the BE3 engine and come down for a nice soft landing on the pad. Now, as the capsule is, is getting that microgravity time, it's gonna start to slow itself down. It's not as aerodynamic. It's got some more drag. It's going to send up it's gonna send up some drogue shoots and then that's gonna slow the capsule down and then three big beautiful shoots will appear where the capsule glides down slowly to the ground with a, a thruster system that will then give that nice cushiony landing. Now the most important part is that as that booster's coming down, it's got the, the LIDAR sensors on it and that's really simulating a lunar landing and so they're getting a lot of information as the booster comes down. It's really when those sensors get to go to work. So can't wait to see after today's flight the new information that they're gonna get um, off of those sensors. Me too, and I'm so excited to see that flight profile live in action here shortly. New Shepard operational payload mission, New Shepard 17 with NASA's lunar landing sensors, so much from Club for the Future, and a number of other really critical science and research. Well, it is nearly showtime here. We're getting ready to hand it over to New Shepard as she starts to come alive for launch. New Shepard is fully autonomous, so in a couple seconds here, the rocket is gonna go through a series of final subsystem checks. Let's wait for that and look, but also listen.
There you see those aft fin checks, the fins at the base of the booster that help direct the vehicle on ascent and descent. We have just entered a brief hold, but there you can also see that BE3 engine nozzle gimbling at the bottom of your screen. That BE3 is moving to help maneuver the rocket and ensure a free range of motion. At this point, we're also pressurizing our tanks, so we're keeping an eye on pressure and temperature in those propellant tanks. Both will, of course, need to stay in the green zone for today's mission. If you're just joining us, we are in a brief hold here, but we are at T minus one minute and 15 seconds until New Shepard's 17th mission to space. I love looking through those windows and seeing all the science and research inside. We are still in a brief hold here at T minus one minute and 15 seconds until New Shepard's 17th mission to space. We'll keep you updated here shortly.
The team is currently dealing with a payload readiness issue. We just spoke with Mission Control. We're in a continued hold at T minus one minute and 15 seconds here at New Shepard's 17th flight to space. So just be patient with us here until we release the hold. Thank you all for joining us today for NS17. As you can see, we have reset the clock to 10 minutes as the team works to address the payload issue, but we are still in a hold, so we'll check back with you soon.
Thank you all for your patience as we make sure our customer payloads are ready for today's mission. Thank you for joining us for NS17. This hold should end shortly.
the count has resumed for a new Shepard 17 mission to space full of payloads today. So excited for this science and research. While the clock continues, let's talk about the main priority on every New Shepard mission, be it payloads or people, and that's safety. Human safety is fundamental to design, but especially the crew capsule. The capsule is the most highly redundant and safe space flight system that has ever been designed or flown. We have redundancy that if the system fails, you have a backup system, and in most cases, you have a backup to the backup system. The capsule is designed to be safe, only two of the main parachutes open, and so we wanted to test that in real life on M5, and it worked perfectly. Now, if the capsule is going down way too fast, the retro rocket actually compensates by adjusting the amount of thrust. Our third and fourth safety systems engage, which is a crushable section. Then the seats have a scissor mechanism that has further energy absorption. The capsule has an escape system designed in case there is something wrong detected on the propulsion module to get the astronauts away to safety. From the moment that we close the hatch, we can go escape enabled and have very high confidence that we can keep people safe. The overall mission of Blue Origin has remained completely the same. We are here to safely build the road to space. We are at just under T minus eight minutes here for New Shepard's 17th mission. We just saw that great video on the importance of safety. Kaya, I know as a pilot, safety is your number one priority in the plane. So can you tell us a little bit about that from your experience? Sure, I mean, with New Shepard, it really comes down to the design and so much redundancy has been built into New Shepard. She's a fully autonomous vehicle. so. Folks like me, we don't have to fly the rocket, which is really nice, um, but it's all about the autonomy and the redundancy. And as, as Gary Lay mentioned in the video, uh, he said, there's a backup to the backup. And that's really what redundancy is all about. Uh, the safety methods that were built in, if something fails, there's a backup system that would kick in uh, and sometimes a backup to the backup to the backup, uh, which is a great, great design uh, it, and it's a, autonomous design and it's a safe design and that's kind of what puts all my confidence if I'm not flying a vehicle I at least want to know that there's redundancy built in and it's a safe vehicle so I'm ready to fly. Well thanks Kai and let's take a look at that safe design out on the pad as she prepares for launch shortly.
As we wait for liftoff of New Shepherd here in just about four minutes, let's talk about the history of the New Shepherd program across all 16 previous flights, the why and the how of what we do, and it is all about safety. For New Shepherd, we've been following an aggressive step-by-step -step approach from the beginning. The first time we flew New Shepard, we demonstrated every single aspect, re-entry, parachute deployment, and that mission was 100% successful for the capsule. M2 was about rolling in changes and trying it again. This time we stuck the landing, but we needed to show we could do it again. So that was what M3 was. For M4, we pushed the envelope, lighting the engine just seconds before it would impact the ground, and we perfected it at that time. In M5, we intentionally did not deploy one of the main parachutes, and it worked perfectly. We had done a pad escape test that the capsule can launch and escape if there is an accident on the pad. The M6 mission was about testing that at its most stressing condition. We ignited the solid rocket motor in flight and showed that we can recover the capsule safely. For M7, what we introduced was a new capsule design. M8 was just a repeat. And then the third escape test was to show that we could escape in space. So on M9, the capsule laid off its a solid rocket motor and landed safely. M9 and M13, we are flying payload missions for customers giving us even more and more confidence in the capability of the New Shepard system. 13 was a perfect flight, preparing for the M14 mission, another verification and check. We're ready for first human flight. Love revisiting New Shepard's really imp impressive flight history. Also love seeing Mannequin Skywalker in there for a couple missions. We are two minutes away from launch here. Let's hand it over to New Shepard as she sits on the pad and take a look. Here we are, T minus one minute until launch. And here we are at launch. It's finally time. Let's hand it over to Mission Control. Godspeed, New Shepard, and best of luck to our payload customers on board. T minus 16 seconds, guidance internal. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Command engine start. 2, 1, 0. has cleared the tower on her way to space from the West Texas desert 
carrying Lunar Lander technology, as well as New Shepard's first ever art installation. You can see on your screen, we're gaining speed as New Shepard lifts off towards space. In about 10 seconds here, we'll be coming up on max Q, which is the toughest point of flight for the vehicle itself. Look at her go. And we have successfully punched through max Q where the aerodynamic stresses on the vehicle were at the maximum. Such a beautiful, clean burn on that BE3 engine and you see the West Texas desert disappearing away. As you can see on your screen, that altitude monitor and that velocity are on the bottom. She is really picking up speed on her way to space. Keep an eye out shortly for that main engine cutoff where we'll cut off that BE3 engine. New Shepard is now coasting at over 1,700 miles per hour. And there we have it, main engine cutoff. New Shepard is at 2,000 miles per hour, and those experiments are just seconds away from getting their several minutes of microgravity and performing their research. There is that zero G indicator on the screen. Shortly, you'll start to see those two distinct crafts as the booster starts heading back towards Earth and those experiments in the capsule start performing their science. At this point in flight, if there were humans flying in that capsule, they'd be getting up out of their seats, floating around. I know I can't wait for that and Kaya definitely can't wait for that. And super importantly for today, those payloads on board are experiencing three to four minutes of clean microgravity. Science is collecting its data and that booster with its NASA lunar landing sensors are getting ready to come back for a precision landing in the West Texas desert. Well, we just received confirmation of Apogee for the crew capsule. That Apogee is over that Kármán line, the internationally recognized line of space, and that's the highest point the crew capsule will travel today. You can now see that booster is headed back from space for the eighth time, and those lunar landing sensors are really going to work at this point as the booster make it, makes its way back to the pad for a precise landing in West Texas. Shortly, the booster itself is going to reach its atmospheric pierce point. And what that means is it's when the rocket is returning from space and re-entering that atmosphere. So those fins and those control surfaces on the fins will start to have air pressure push against them.
Those wedge and ring fins are really going to work here. Really important parts of the new Shepard design as that booster makes its way back to the landing pad, which is just two miles north of where that vehicle took off. You can see those two beautiful, distinct crafts in the middle of your screen. That West Texas desert is starting to come into focus here on the right side of your screen. Those drag brakes will be deploying shortly. As we discussed, the booster will be reaching its maximum re-entry velocity soon, which is just under Mach 4. That booster shape causes a lot less drag than the crew capsule, so the booster will win this race back to Earth. There go those drag brakes. This is a critical step in slowing the booster down on its approach. You see this velocity decreasing quite rapidly on the left side of your screen. Those in West Texas are now hearing that sonic boom. New Shepard is on approach. That BE-3 engine relay confirmed. Landing gear deployed. That beautiful hover. And booster touchdown. Look at that, just like she was landing on the moon. Hopefully those NASA landing sensors got some incredible data today. I have to tell you, I'm often asked if that is slow-mo or CGI. It definitely is not, I can assure you that. Look at her there on the pad after her eighth trip to space for that booster. It just never gets old, Jackie. It never it's does. such a beautiful flight. We have reacquired the crew capsule there in the minute in the middle of your screen. Shortly, those initial drogue parachutes will deploy, which slow down the capsule on its return. So excited to see those experiments in there on their way back. There go the drogues. That capsule speed will slow, and the main parachutes will follow shortly here. And there go the mains further slowing the crew capsule here on its way back to the West Texas desert. They'll start to completely inflate here and that West Texas landscape will come into the view in your background. You can see how substantially that velocity of the capsule has slowed at this point. Do keep in mind as we approach the desert here, that West Texas dust uh, does kick up a lot. Oh my gosh, you can see that beautiful capsule with the landed booster in the background there. Our retro thrust system in the base of the crew capsule will kick up a tremendous amount of dust as it fires for that nice soft landing. Rest assured, the payloads will enjoy quite a soft touchdown in just a few seconds here. That shot is incredible. Two hundred feet from the surface. And touchdown of the crew capsule. Another beautiful launch and landing for New Shepard. 
Huge, enormous congratulations to Team Blue. Congratulations to our friends at NASA, especially in the flight opportunities and tipping point programs. And congrats to all of the customers who flew with us today. Just another beautiful flight. I cannot wait to see our next crew flight as well coming up really soon. So everything looks to have gone so well. Uh, let's take a look at some of the unofficial stats. And those stats are still coming in, so bear with us just a minute. Here they are. All right, so our maximum ascent velocity, we went to 2,229 miles per hour. Our crew capsule apogee, the highest point that it reached was 347,430 feet. Our mission start time was at 9.31 a.m. Central Time. Thanks, everyone, for the patience on the holds. But as you can see, it always pays off. And our mission elapsed time was 10 minutes and 38 seconds. What an exciting, exciting 17th launch of New Shepard today. If today inspired you, which we really hope it did, we encourage you to join our growing team here at Blue Origin. I can tell you I've been at Blue for just under five years, and it is a really special place to work. Check our website for openings on the careers page. We cannot wait to see you one day at a Blue site uh, near us. And until then, Jackie, thank you so much. This was such a cool experience, beautiful flight. Today was such a celebration of the payloads. And as we mentioned, we have another human flight coming soon. So again, if you're interested in purchasing a ticket to fly on New Shepard, please visit blueorigin.com, click on the link, fly to space, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, Kaya. It was so great teaming up with you today. Can't wait to team up in the crew capsule someday for our own mission. That's all from us, he from us here. Please follow Blue Origin's social and website for launch updates and what's next. Until our next launch, Gridatum Ferocitor.